was really good fam. We're somehow already nearing the halfway point of 2021 and with that it seems like a good time to reflect on what's going on around us in the economy at large. Today, we're going to dig into KDI's economic bulletin and quickly summarize a few things of note. You're watching Sekidur and this is where we're at in June of 2021. Now before we continue, we just like to remind you that this channel is meant for general education purposes only and isn't meant to replace any legal or financial advice from a paid professional. No mention of any stock on this channel should be considered a tip to buy, sell, or hold that stock specifically as we can't really know what is the right choice for you in your individual case. We can't know what kind of security best suits your needs and your goals but we'd love it if you could like this video and subscribe to the channel and stick with us as we explore ways to figure out how to make that decision for yourself. For everybody who's been with us for time, mad love. We really thank you from the bottom of our hearts and I hope that we can continue to contribute to whatever it is that you're looking to achieve in your personal financial life. Now let's get to it. Alright, we're going to start a little outside of the report with recent news of the OECD's upgrade of the Republic of Korea's GDP growth forecast from 3.3% to 3.8% as the Bank of Korea similarly increased its growth outlook from 1% up to 4% on the expectation of export growth which is also reflected in the IMF's upgrade of our growth percentage estimate from 3.1 to 36 now these predictions reflect a generally positive outlook on the country's recovery from the pandemic as vaccinations continue to roll out and the economy returns to and exceeds previous form. Now this is obviously good news but before we get too far ahead of ourselves it's definitely valuable to look at the economic indicators around us at the halfway point of this year as well. So staying with the trend in exports that we saw during the pandemic, the KDI reports a 41.1% jump in exports back in April on the back of microchips and petrochemicals with average daily exports improving by 29.4% from this time last year. Now it's important to note that April of last year was still a weird time where the world economy was reeling from the pandemic and attempting to figure out how to persevere so all things considered that number is probably a little bit misleading. In reporting, this is often referred to as a low base case, aka a low initial amount leading to a larger perceived change in outcome. In any case, it's still a positive sign that Korea's major industries are thriving during the recovery period and can hopefully continue to do so over the long term. Now, focusing on what's going on domestically, both the CSI and the BSI both rose in April, suggesting that overall sentiment towards our economy has been improving on both the business and the consumer front. And this is bolstered by positive momentum in the job market which added 652,000 jobs which is significantly more than the number of jobs that were added at the same time in 2020. Obviously we would like to see more as the economy recovers but in any case it's still positive momentum which is a good thing for us to be seeing. Now one negative thing to note has been the country's largest inflation growth in 9 years due to a number of factors and that's kind of what we're going to talk about in this episode. As a reminder for those who aren't familiar with the term, inflation simply refers to the decline of the purchasing power of a currency over time. We do a more in-depth explanation in an older video in the top right hand corner of your screen right now so if you feel the need for a refresher, feel free to click through that but otherwise we're just going to keep it moving. Now when it comes to identifying the catalysts for any change in any real state of being, there are always at least two categories of factors to consider internal factors and external factors. Now naturally, the former term refers to intrinsic changes to an entity. In this case, this can refer to things like qualitative easing, interest rate changes, monetary policy, or structural regime changes. Regime. Regime changes. External factors refer to things that occur outside of the control of the stakeholders of the affected phenomenon. With inflation, this can refer to things like sanctions, wars, foreign exchange, externalities from foreign trade spats like that between the US and China. Um, Amir Kia actually wrote a paper on this in 2004 for Carleton University, which I'll link in the comment section below if you're looking to get a better understanding of how internal and external factors influence inflation. But for now, let's quickly hit on a few of the reasons that we're seeing unexpected inflation in the short term. Now Reuters marks the rise in consumer prices at 2.6% matching a high of 2.6% in April of 2012, with much of this due to two main factors according to Finance Minister Hong Nam Ki. The first factor he mentions is a low base case, and the second he mentions is temporary disruptions to supply chains. Now the low base case they refer to occurred as a result of deflation that came with last year's economic pullback due to the pandemic. 
For many people who've just started looking into economic indicators, markets, and investments this year, it's important to recognize that a lot of the growth numbers on both micro and macro levels have to, have to, have to be considered in light of the massive economic shock faced in the early portion of 2020 that we're still kind of reeling from. At the midpoint of last year, we saw a bit of a deflationary period in which the one gained more buying power on the back of some things like extremely low oil prices due to both disrupted supply chains and lower demand for commodities, with all the stay-at-home orders and travel bans and all that. On top of that, with people staying home and not going out, this increased their liquidity, while also decreasing the competition for things like basic materials that often run on high demand within the service sector. Ultimately, all of these factors, though, ended up loading up like a slingshot that strengthened the impact of the inflationary period that we're facing right now. Now, similar to the pullback in spending power was the pullback in consumer demand as regular mans locked up their cash and strapped up their spending while stuck at home. Now, with a re-energized consumer base and more people getting back to work, i.e. more people with more expendable money, it wouldn't be strange to see that demand soar in the short term. Furthermore, with the service sector making a rebound, there's more competition for things like meat and produce on top of everything else. Still, that may not be enough to explain the amount of inflation that we're seeing at the moment since more people buying eggs doesn't necessarily mean that the market price of eggs will shoot up like they have immediately in the short term. Instead, to explain the rise in prices for many consumer goods, there are a number of things that we can point to that are outside of the scope of governmental control. Specifically, I'm referring to point two, the temporary disruptions to supply chains. Now there are multiple disruptions we're talking about, but one of the main things to note is that the prices of food, agriculture, and fisheries output surged by 12.1% on average, and petroleum surged by 23%. By the way, petroleum and oil is just another case of low base from 12 months ago, returning back to normal as other countries near herd immunity, whereas a few factors went into the surge in agriculture prices such as the severe avian flu outbreak from November till April and May, which ultimately led to high alerts and the culling of birds within a one kilometer radius of the outbreak. Prices on imports have also raised on the backs of increased international shipping costs as well. So what is there to do in the face of inflation? Well, we obviously aren't in the halls of government debating the correct path to take in economic and monetary policy going forward, so our influence is limited on that front. However, we do have the ability to place our money in places that protect it from inflation like the stock market, commodities, or bonds. All of these can play a big role in maintaining the purchasing power of your existing wealth in the long term. But when it comes to managing the short term, it may not be a bad idea to get back to buying those onduri sangpungwan since a 5% return on cash immediately is far greater than the 2.6% inflation that we're sitting in. Obviously, you can only spend it on things like food, but again, you have to buy food anyways. Another thing you could do is apply for a cashback credit card or increase your use of that cashback credit card because there's really no easier way to get cash back for buying stuff. Now before we go, I just want to summarize some basic takeaways that I may or may not have covered very well over the course of this video. On a positive note, earnest recovery is starting to don its little head with the retail and service sectors recovering over the past few months. Indicators like the Retail Sales Index and the Composite Consumer Sentiment Index are both positive for the first time since the beginning months of the pandemic, and this is supported by significant growth in the job market with over 622,000 new jobs being created, and exports and manufacturing is still booming. Now on a bad note, inflation is at a 9 year high with consumer prices up an average of 2.6% when compared to last year. This in turn is heavily influenced by disruptions to the supply chains which can mean anything from bad harvest, bird flu and general difficulties with international trade born of things like the US's continued balkanization of China, increased freight rates and more. This is all betrayed by a recovery of petroleum prices as well as widespread shortages in raw materials leading to high priced commodities which may in turn slow the recovery process and spur inflation ever onward. Alright that was a lot but I tried to keep it short. Anyways, I hope that covers most of the basic takeaways but if you're interested in learning more I'll leave a link to the KDI articles in the description box below. That's it for me, but come back soon because we'll be putting together a little thing about brokerage fees in response to a message we got from our sister Rosemary on Instagram. In the meantime, check out the new episodes of This Korean Life and stop by our friends over at Hangang Magazine. We'll see you in a few. Take it easy.